All right. So let's get officially started. Um, let me get the sign in sheet passed around. So homework number two has been graded. It's been returned to you. Uh, homework number three is currently being graded. I'm hoping to get that back sometime early next week. Um, homework number four, that's due Wednesday. Um, if I haven't gotten the homework three, um, well, I'll tell you what, I might actually turn homework three solution on like now. Um, well, obviously not right now because we're in class, but I'll probably turn that on um, sometime after class so that you all have that study over the weekend and you all are obviously working on homework four. So uh, that's due on Wednesday. Remember, no late submissions on, on homework four because I'm giving you the solution that day. We're having our exam review and then we're having the exam on Friday. A couple things, I guess I, I should have, I mean, it, it's, it's already online, but I guess I should have mentioned it. The exam review slides are already on Blackboard. You all can download those and look at those now. Um, another thing I'll mention, um, I, I passed out homework two today. Uh, if you are just now coming in or didn't get yours, don't worry. I'll just get them to you after, uh, after class, but uh, I've already uh, gone ahead and returned that. Um, any questions? Sound good? All right. So I want to get back into the world of T-beams, uh, flanged sections. Now, just so everybody is clear on a couple things, uh, this is a good place to start. <clears throat> so there are really um, two sort of main complications associated with, uh, uh, with T-beam analysis. The first is determining how much of the slab uh, we consider to be effective when transferring stress to the beam. Remember, a lot of times it's the tributary width, but not always. Um, it, it's, it's basically an empirical expression, pretty easy to compute. The only difference between T-beams and L-beams is just a different effective width. It doesn't really change anything uh, 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 moving forward. Um, so that's one thing, this complication. But the real sort of added complication for T-beams is this. Okay? The idea that, that you have a stress block that is either rectangular or T-shaped. And if it's T-shaped, determining the depth of your stress block, such as C equals T, is a little different. And then actually determining your moment capacity is a little different. So we got to be kind of careful on how we do that. I'm going to do the T-beam analysis portion the true T-beam analysis portion, I'm probably going to do it a little differently than you would expect, but there's a specific reason why I'm going to do that. Um, you're going to see here in a second how the terms that we develop for true T-beam analysis, um, you're going to see how they play into a design philosophy uh, later on. But let's just you know walk before we can run. We did this example last time. Remind me, was this a rectangular beam or a true T-beam? It was rectangular. In the end, the stress block was rectangular. It was only about 1.7 inches deep. So in the end, this is nothing more than a rectangular uh, beam that just looks T-shaped. Now, that seems kind of strange. But when the stress block is rectangular, it doesn't change anything about the analysis. Here, though, on, on problem 9b, now you don't know just looking at the, uh, uh, just looking at the example, but if you have any uh, powers of precognition, if example 9a was a rectangular T-beam, take a wild guess what's going to happen on example 9b. It's going to be a true T-beam. Uh, but don't worry, we'll take this one step at a time, and I think you'll see how this works. Okay. Whoop. Okay. Woo. That is a T-beam. Yes, it is. Okay. Now, we're on example 9B. Oh, my goodness. I'm knocking stuff over all over the place. And, of course, I unplug the pin. I was so happy that it was working before class, and then I unplug it. I know. That's what I'm It'll never work again. <laughs> ah, it works. On a Friday, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's Friday and it's rainy. Everybody's like, ugh. Yeah. 
But all this concrete design should just, you know, liven you up, right? Yeah, it's really dead in here. I mean, that joke. Oh, goodness. Again, the age-old structural engineering philosophical question, are zombies dead load or live load? I mean, you... There's a debate to be had about that. I would say for your live load. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody, chill, chill out. Settle down. Settle down. All right. So the first thing that we need to determine is is equilibrium. Okay. And what I mean by that is we need to determine what's going on with C equals T. Now I'm going to do this in a very similar fashion to what we did. Uh, on the uh, on the previous example, if you recall, we said on the previous example that 0 0.85 FC prime times the area in compression, well, however big the stress block is, uh, has got to equal FY times AS. So we then said that the area in compression, you know, just solving, has got to be well. That's going to bug me because we usually say ASFY, so ASFY. So it's ASFY divided by 0 0.85 FC prime. So plug and chug. So uh, we've got our area of steel right here. It's 10.19 square inches times uh, 60 KSI, <coughs> excuse me, divided by 0 0.85 times 4 KSI. And what do we get when we chug that out? One seventy nine point eight two. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, so everybody agrees that I have to have that much area up, up top on that beam. That that's the area of the stress block that is required to achieve equilibrium. In other words, C equals T uh, for our, at our ultimate uh, flexural capacity. So what I'm then going to do is I want to calculate just what's the area of that flange. Well, symbolically, BHF, which is 30 times 4, which is 120, right? So tell me just by looking at this, is this a rectangular beam, a T-beam, or a true T-beam? It's true because if we look at, like, like, just look at these numbers, would you agree that the stress block look, has got to look something kind of like this? Like it's got to look something like that. We don't know how deep it is, but it's got to look something like this. Okay. Now, um, I want everybody to be clear on terminology. Remember our stress block depth A? How do you define A? Like, not just for this problem, but in general. No, 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 no. no. Well, centroid. Okay. We're getting a lot of answers. I'm going to take them one at a time. So you said ASFY over 0.85 FC prime B. That is only the case if it's rectangular. Okay. What, what I'm asking is just what is A? And I'm saying A is the depth of the stress block. Okay. What I'm getting at is, is this. We measure A from the top of the beam to the bottom of the stress block. Always. So, so what I'm getting at is A is this dimension. That's A, okay? This is not A. What would this dimension be? That is H plus 272. We're not there. But symbolically, A minus HF. I want there to be a very clear distinction between what's A 
and what's not. That's, that's sort of what I'm getting at. Does, there, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, if we've got a true T-beam, like we can solve, I mean, like he was able to just look at it and sort of figure it out, and it's really not that complicated. But let's see if we can derive some sort of symbolic expression for what A is in this scenario. So let's look at this red shaded area. Let's look at this image. And let me ask you a question. What is the area in compression? Somebody tell me symbolically what it is. Because of these two. The area of the flange, the area of this top portion is 120. But I need like 180 square inches in compression. So that stress block has to dip down into that shape a little bit. So does, it make, does that make sense that the stress block looks like that? Because the stress block is a T, it's a true T-beam. If the stress block is just in the top flange, it's just a rectangle. That would be a rectangular T-beam. Does that make sense? All right. All right. Say, say that a little louder. Plus BHF. Okay. Now, let's walk through how we did that. Okay. So what he did, what Mr. Fitzpatrick did, is he said, all right, how do I compute the area of that shaded region? What's well, the area of the upper rectangle and the area of the bottom rectangle? The upper rectangle is just BHF. The area of the bottom rectangle is BW, the width, times the quantity, A minus HF. Does that make sense? And in this expression, what do we not know? A, because we know that this is 179 point whatever, and we know all of the other dimensions. So now we just got to solve. So I propose that to solve this, we say, all right. So first off, one thing I am going to do is I'm going to say this right here, this is just the area of the flange. All right. So to solve for A, let's subtract this on over to the other side. So area and compression minus the area of the flange is BW A minus HF, right? Then what do I do? You tell me. You are experts at algebra. What's true, if we're solving for A, we can just divide by BW. Because that, that'll cancel that, and then all we have over here on the right is we have A minus HF. And then we have area and compression minus area flange over BW. Does that make sense? So I propose that A equals HF plus um, area and compression minus the area of the flange over BW. So that is 4 inches plus uh, 179.82 square inches minus 120 divided by what? Was that 14 inches? And what does that come out to be? 8.2, is it 8.270? 73. Does that make sense? And that wasn't every time for a true team. For a true team. That's why we did it symbolically. That's a, yeah, that, that's why we did it. So yes, it will work every time. If it's a true T-beam. If it's not, you'll get some weird answers. So that's why we do this comparison up here. If the area in compression is greater than the flange area, it's a true T-beam. If not, it's a rectangular T-beam, and you just do what you've been doing before. So far, so good? All right. Any questions? Now, before we go ahead and compute MN, I'm actually going to sort of go off here on the side. And I'm going to go ahead and determine phi, okay? Because that isn't any different, okay? 
phi is still based on the strain level in the steel. As long as the strain in the steel is greater than 0 0.005, then phi is 0.9. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now, okay? Because we've got a dimension for A. We can calculate C and the strain. We can do that quite easily because that doesn't change. So walk me through this. What do I got to do? What's, if I want to determine phi based off the data I've got right now, what's step one? <coughs> Say that again. Now, you said strain, and you do have to determine the strain, but you can't determine the strain without C. So, so C is, how do I do that? How do I cut? A over beta 1. So that's 8.273 inches divided by what's beta 1? It's 0.85, and why is it 0.85? Because it's 4 KSI concrete, exactly right. Nine point seven three zero. Three. Okay. Second on that. Second. All right. Now our strain. Zero point zero zero three. D minus C over C. So that is zero point zero zero three. Uh, what was D? Thirty. Thirty inches minus 9.733 over 9.733. So, so what does that come out to be? Bless you. 6, give me a couple more. 2, 4, 2, 5. Not really from an accuracy standpoint. I, I just like when we're doing examples in class, I like there to be a little bit more specificity with the numbers so that they're a little more unique so we all know what we're talking about. But not really. You could probably go with two decimal places and be fine. But that way, like when I see, because we've got like a 8.273 and a 9.733, I don't know, three decimal places gives the numbers enough uniqueness so that we all know what we're talking about. But no, you could probably go with two and you'd be fine. Now, but Going back to this, what does this tell you? There we go. So that is greater than 0 0.005. So that means that phi is 0 0.9. Make sense? Okay. Any questions so far? It's where the strain goes from compression to tension. So I actually have a pretty good image of that in the exam review slides, I think. Let me pull this up. You're like, oh, is he going to pull up the exam? Yeah, here we, here we go. This is a perfect way of describing it right here. So C is from the top of the beam to where the strain equals zero. A is from the top of the beam to the bottom of your stress block. They are related by beta 1. I know sometimes that's a little weird, but A is sort of looking at it from the stress standpoint, B or C is looking at it from the strain standpoint. And you've got to have this in order to use similar triangles to determine that. No, 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 no. Uh, I get what you're saying. That it, it, it's, not, it's not a idealization of the triangle. Okay? A, a couple things. Number one, this is strain and this is stress. So they're two different things. What the stress block is, is so in reality, the stress block looks like that. You know, it, it's, not, it's non linear. So this is trying to take that nonlinear stress block and turn it into rectangles that we as engineers can determine centroids of and things like that a lot easier. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that's fine. Everybody else good with that? You don't, don't get confused with that though because there's a difference between the depth of the stress block and compression and the depth of the strain region. The reason why I say depth to the neutral axis is because there's no strain at the neutral axis. It's not in compression or tension. So, does that make sense? 
Yes. Yes, because as concrete gets stronger, it gets less ductile. So your stress block sharp, uh, shortens as a result. It can't handle as much strain, so your strain profile sort of, sort of does that. That's a good question. That's a good point. Does that make sense? Yes. Because it, it, it's reflective of what concrete behavior really looks like. And I don't want to get too far off topic, but let me sort of explain. Like in reality, if you look at the stress strain curve of like a concrete cylinder, it'll dip up and then it'll kind of dip down a little bit before it cracks. That, that's sort of what happened. We, we kind of saw the same thing with that sort of dip down. We kind of saw something very similar with steel. I mean, the material, you know, science is way different. But if you remember, the stress strain curve for steel sort of goes up and then it kind of trails down before it fails. It's kind of the same thing. Does that make sense? Really, like, imagine taking this and whoop, doing that. Sound good? All right. Um, now let, let's get back to this one because I, I, this is where things are going to get a little on the strange side. So I want, um, I want everybody to make sense of this. So are, is everybody okay moving forward? Everybody got all this? Okay. All right. Now. Okay. We need to determine the nominal moment capacity. Not no. Why did I say nomen? It <laughs> nomen. Man, I, I'm. I, whew, that was bad. Nomen capacity. We all had those moments. These are the days of our live loads, right? Okay, okay. Now, wh watch this. Uh, I want everybody to remember, how did we determine MN for a rectangular beam? Like, what's the formula? ASFYD minus A over 2. But let's get back to basics. Let's get back to fundamentals. How did we determine that? Like, like it was a force times moment arm, right? Now, the force was ASFY. It could have been either the compressive force or the tensile force. But we're lazy. We do two terms instead of, instead of four. So we did ASFY as the force, and the moment arm was D minus A over 2. Okay? So let me show you how I'm going to do this for nominal moment capacity. Okay? So okay. So here's our T-beam, and we've got some steel here. And I, I'm drawing eight bars, but it doesn't matter. It's just a bunch of steel. And I, and I got a stress block that looks something about like that. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Now, this, this will sound strange, but this is what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to ultimately take this nominal moment capacity, and I'm going to split it up into two different couples. I'm going to say a nominal moment capacity for the flange couple plus the nominal moment capacity for the web couple. All right. I'm doing this for a very specific reason. I'm doing this because we can use this differentiation to develop a design philosophy for true T-beams that makes our lives a little easier. But, but everybody just sort of bear with me. Okay. Now classically the way that we do this is as follows. We say, all right, this T-beam equals the following. It equals this T-beam, and, and bear with me because i got a lot of drawing to do. So you'll, you'll see what's going on here, here in a sec. Um, and then this. So just bear with me for a sec. Plus the, uh, I know. <laughs> that was on purpose. Oh, cool. Boom. <laughs> okay. All right. 
and then this We'll draw a happy little bush over here in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> take, take the pen and just, <laughs> just beat the devil out of it. <laughs> so like that? You know, nobody's even asking if I'll sport the hair. Like, no. <laughs> Okay, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing here, just so everybody's aware, is we're taking the nominal moment capacity and we're saying it's the nominal moment capacity from this couple plus the nominal moment capacity from this couple. Now, a couple things, okay? For each of these couples, compression has to equal tension because they still have to maintain equilibrium. So I actually drew the rebar to be kind of different on purpose, okay? So, you know, I have here some area of steel, right? This is going to have some amount of steel, and this steel needs to be whatever it needs to be for C equals T. And this steel needs to be whatever it needs to be so that C equals T here. But this plus this has got to add up to be that. Th does that make sense? That's going to be how we go about this from a design phase. And when, we, when we're designing a true T-beam, what we're going to have, we're going to have our moments that we have to design the beam for, our MU. What we're going to actually do is we're going to determine the moment capacity of this and then back calculate how much moment capacity we need from this in order to meet our load demand. That's going to be how we determine the steel. But just, uh, just, just bear with me. So... Um, let, let's take a look at a couple things, all right? What I want to do is I want to write out some compressive forces, okay? So help me out. How would we determine the compressive force in the flange, okay? Now, we determine compressive forces like we've been doing the whole time. Like when we did it for a rectangular beam, it was what? 0.85 FC prime AB, right? So how do we do this? It'd be 0.85 FC prime times, now what's the area of these rectangles? Let, let's look at that. Let me ask you this. What is this dimension right here? That's B. All right? What is this dimension right here? And what is this dimension right here? H sub F. How about this? Would you agree that the area of these two rectangles together is... Would you agree with that? So let's calculate that out. So 0 0.85 FC prime, or well, calculating it out. So that's 4 KSI. Now, what's B and BW? So 30 minus 14 times, and what's the flange height? So that's C sub F. Now, somebody else tell me, what's C sub W? What's this compressive force over here going to be on the right? Well, we know this dimension, that's B sub W, what is this dimension? That's A, exactly. What's that? That's A. So how about this? 0 0.85 FC prime ABW, 0 0.85 I, I need to get that number here in a sec, so 4 KSI, and then what's A again? And what was BW? Say it again. All right, so what's the top one and the bottom one? What's the top one? 217 kips, right? These are forces. 
Now, what is CW? Say it again. 393.79 kips. What's that? All right. Now, watch this. What is CF plus CW equal? So like 611.4. Alright, that's so would you agree that's the total compressive force in the section? How would you calculate the total tensile force in the section? ASFY? Am I right? What is AS? And what is 60 KSI? Or FY. Did I just say what is 60 KSI? Did they give me decaf? I think they did. My goodness. What, what are, take these two numbers and put them into your Casios and tell me what you get. So this right here was not necessary for the problem, but it's a check to ensure that your value of A is right. Compression equals tension. Let me say this. It's going to be honestly kind of necessary for doubly reinforced beams because one thing that's kind of complicated in doubly reinforced beams is how exactly you compute uh, C. It's, it's actually kind of tricky. It's trickier than this. So doing this is kind of necessary for, for, that, for that computation. So there's something to be aware of. Now, now, let me ask you a question. Nominal moment capacity, force times a distance, all right? Force times a distance, what we need are moment arms, right? So remember, if a moment, so if a moment is a force times a moment arm, help me out. What is the moment arm for the flange and the moment arm for the web? Now what I mean by that is, how did we get D minus A over 2? That was from the center of the steel to the center of the stress block, right? What is what is the calculation? Like how do my goodness? How do I get from the center of the stress block and the flange to the center of the steel? How do I do that? D minus H F over two. So remember, D is from here to here, right? So that makes sense from the center of this steel to the top, to the t center of this, so we go from D minus half that flange height. Does that make sense? So how, what is it for ZW? D minus, a D minus A over 2. Okay. So what I'm getting at is I propose then, therefore, MN is C sub F D minus H F over 2 plus C sub W D minus A over 2. What do you think? It's not bad, right? It's just forces and distances. It's just moments. So what do we got? Um, two. Ooh. Leave me away from me. 217.6 kips times, what was D again? 30. 30. 30 inches minus, bless you, minus 40, or 4 over 2 plus, and then this was, what was this, 3, 
93.79, probably more like 393.8, and then 30 inches minus 8.273 over 2. So what does that come out to be? Making y'all do some, some calculations in an upper level engineering class. Who do you think you are? We wanted to do Bob Ross painting. We didn't want All right, so 16 what? So 85. Okay, and what it, what's the dimensions, the units? Inch kips. Okay, do I have a second on the calculation? Yep. All right, now how do I turn that into foot kips? Divide by 12. So what is that divided by 12? Point 0.5 foot kips. Now that's MN. How do I determine phi MN? What's phi? 0.9. So what is phi MN? Twelve twenty point eight. So remember, that is our resistance. That is how strong this beam is once it has been adjusted by uncertainty factors. Okay? Make sense? Now, are there any questions? Okay. Now, if there are no questions, what I want to do is I want to briefly sort of get into the design world. If I can find the slides. Okay. And I want to talk about design of T-beams. Okay. So let me explain what's going on from a design standpoint. Because see, and, and that's going to sort of be a general pattern of how we do things in this class is we first learn how to analyze, you know, determine the capacity. And if you understand how much moment it takes to fail a T-beam, you then can ask, well, how much reinforcement do I need so that that doesn't happen? Or how big does the beam need to be such that that doesn't happen? That's design, okay? So now let's talk about design of T-beams, okay? Now, in T-beam design, we're dealing primarily with the design of a known cross-section. It's not like uh, rectangular beams where sometimes we're just guessing from square one. But T-beam design usually deal with known cross-sections for one of two reasons. If you're looking at cast-in-place property or, or projects, well, the flange thickness has already been determined because that's however thick the floor slab is. So you've already done that. And the beam, you can either design that from a moment standpoint or a shear standpoint, and you can sort of design that separately as well. So you can sort of design the beam and the slab independently and then go back at it from a T-beam standpoint and see if you can uh, uh, thin up your reinforcement a little bit. That's if it's cast in place. If it's precast and you're dealing with a, a, a prefabricated unit, a lot of times they're T-shaped anyways. So the design of T-beams more often than not is a design of a known cross-section, not one of an unknown cross-section. So the nice thing about that is the only thing we have to do is determine how much reinforcement goes in and we have our design done. Now the main complication is where the neutral axis lies. I want to look at this. Let's look at some symbolic uh, definitions of a rectangular T-beam versus a true T-beam. Look at this. I propose that a rectangular T-beam is any beam where A is less than or equal to HF. Think about that. HF is the height of the flange. A is from the top of the beam to the depth of the stress block. So if A is less than or equal to HF, we have a rectangular T-beam. Otherwise, it's a true T-beam. Make sense? Okay. 
What we do in the design world is we start off by assuming that it's rectangular, okay? And so what I mean by that is because it's rectangular, rectangular, everybody's laughing. What I mean, what? Wait, what? Hold on. No, hold on. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. But there's no power. We can't do this without power. You're right, you two. Well, how are we able to record this video with no power? We're, we're going for five more minutes. You all can relax. We're getting a free answer on the test. Everybody relax, we got five minutes. We don't have the power to make mistakes. I'm going to throw a Star Trek, I'm going to throw a Star Trek structural engineering pun at you. Here, here deal resistance is futile let's just, let's just sort of, let's just, let's just sort of move on okay any star trek fans out there oh come on All right, everybody everybody calm down give give me give me four minutes please all right all right, all right. back to rectangular versus true t-beams i want everybody to pay attention this is kind of important okay what we're going to do in the design phase is this. We're going to make an initial assumption that, that our beam is rectangular, okay? Now, I want to go back to this formula. Does everybody remember this formula? You should be using it kind of right now in your homework assignment. This formula was to determine the reinforcement ratio for a rectangular beam if we know what the cross-section looks like. So this is what we're going to do. In the design world, we're going to start off assuming it's rectangular. We're going to say, all right, let's compute the reinforcement ratio, and then let's take that reinforcement ratio, and let's go back to this, and let's compute what A is, okay? So the idea is sort of this. Let's figure out how much reinforcement we would need if the beam is rectangular, and then take that reinforcement ratio and see if it actually is rectangular, okay? So in our design step-by-step -step process, just so everybody's aware, you're, and everybody's going to say, oh, God, oh, God. The design step-by-step -step process is sort of like 13 steps. But when you get, what will happen is we'll get to, like, step five, and we'll say, okay, if this is less than or equal to HF, you're good. Otherwise, like, skip to step nine, okay? So hope everybody's, you know, okay with that because you, you can see it when we get into the design phase. Like, here we go. So step one, step two, step three. And, you know, if this is true, go to step five. If it's not, go to step eight. So, you know, everybody, everybody can relax there. Okay. So does everybody agree that if we find that A is less than or equal to our flange height, then we're a rectangular beam and we can do it like we did before? If not, if it's a true T-beam, okay, if it is a true T-beam, uh, then this is our scenario, okay? This is what we just had, right? This is what we just had in our previous example. We had a scenario that looked like this. We had a, T, a true T-beam, and we said that the true T-beam was equal to a flange, web, or a flange couple and a web couple, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to take this specific notation. And i got to say, I like this image a lot better than our previous ones because it shows that that's A and then the depth of the neutral axis is C. I kind of like this a lot better. i got to remember that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to split this up and ultimately solve for the area of steel. But the point to make is that there's going to be a little bit of steel required for this couple and a little bit of steel required for this couple. But when you add them up, they add up to be the total amount of steel required. So from a design standpoint, do that one, do that one, add it up, select your steel based off that. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Sound good? It's amazing that I was able to get that done and get it recorded and posted to YouTube with no electricity. Like, I know. Hold on. One, one quick question. We'll leave. Yes. 
Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. No, no, because we're going to select our pattern of reinforcement from the sum, not each one. So then that'll make sense when we get into some math on it. So, all right, that's all I got. I got to post this video, otherwise, you know, I, I won't get the, the YouTube likes. Hit that subscribe button. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.